I mean, they're part of Ulster, but they're not Ulster. The historic Ulster consisted of nine counties, not only the six that are in Northern Ireland, this temporary uh, division uh, of the country, not, not just those six, which include Derry and Antrim, Down, Armagh, Tyrone, and Fermanagh. Those are the six that are uh, in the, the area called Northern Ireland. But then there are three other counties, Donegal, Cavan, and Monaghan, that are also part of historic Ulster. And strictly speaking, when we refer to Ulster, uh, we should have in mind all nine counties. And that's what I'm uh, going to do this evening, refer to the entire province, the nine counties, not just the, the six of Northern Ireland. Well, a little more background. The immigration from Ireland to Prince Edward Island actually occurred in three waves or three phases. And I have summed them up in, in this fashion uh, by calling the first group to come out here from Ireland the colonial pioneers. So that those who came up to about 1810, that is in the 18th century, starting with Governor Patterson from County Donegal, the first governor of Prince Edward Island, and his lieutenant governor at the time, Thomas Debrissay from County Tipperary. From that time forward up to the 19th century, the early 19th century, we can call those people the pioneers. And they came from the north and the south. They weren't very numerous, about 10% of the population in the first census of 1798, about 10% were Irish-born people. So that uh, the second group came from the southeast of Ireland, mainly out of the ports of Waterford and Wexford, some from Cork, but Waterford was the dominant port at that time. And people came down the three rivers, the three great rivers, the three sisters they're called over there, the, uh, uh, and, and uh, came out from Wexford, Waterford, Tipperary, Kilkenny, and Carlow. Some of these people came to us after they had stopped or landed originally in Nova Scotia or New Brunswick. Some of them came to us after they had uh, spent some time in Newfoundland. We understand that. We also, even though we're calling these the Southeast immigrants, we're, we're acknowledging that there were other immigrants at the same time from uh, places like Kerry and Cork, and Dublin, and the Midlands from Leash and Offaly as well. Not very many of them. And these were the people who came between 1800 and 1840. Then the third group, which I have called the, the Monaghan settlers, and then I go on to explain what I mean about that. The Monaghan settlers started to come here in 1830. Well, you may find a few, I have found a few that came before 1830, but uh, they, they were not related to the big movement uh, of settlers at all. They were uh, uh, kind of wild geese on their own, and uh, they ended up here. But there, there weren't very many of those, or at least I haven't discovered them. So between 1830 and 1848, the people from County Monaghan came out. But then you see the, the note beneath that, from Ulster generally, though I call them the Monaghan settlers because they were predominantly from County Monaghan. At least three quarters of these people who came in this period were from the one county in Monaghan. 
but there were others from the other eight counties also coming out. And, uh, and so when I refer to the Monaghan settlers, I'm, I mean uh, the, the group associated with uh, County Monaghan, but not necessarily just from that one county. I had a call one time uh, from uh, a, a lady who uh, was telling me her family background and wanted to know if I could help locate her ancestors. And uh, uh, her name happened to be Trainer. And just uh, when I said, oh, well, you would be among the Monaghan settlers. And she said, oh, no, there's not a Monaghan in our family at all. <laughs> all, all, all. You know, and she, she was very insistent upon this. No mixed marriage there. <laughs> so uh, she was very insistent, and I, I had a difficult time explaining to her that by Monaghan settler I didn't mean that that the, the, the all of the same family name at all, uh, but that they came from the county of Monaghan. Well, she <coughs> reluctantly accepted that, and and so. Uh, anyhow, the, you, you understand the distinction, at least. So, let's move on. I think I, I know my place now. <laughs> I was supposed to go back and explain about the uh, uh, the lady constable, so I'll, I'll do that. The the, the lady constable uh, sailed out of uh, Liverpool in England to Prince Edward Island, but before it uh, still looking for the right map here. But before it sailed from uh, Liverpool, it uh, it had picked up its passengers. I can't find the right map. It had picked up its passengers anyhow uh, from uh, Belfast and Dublin, and uh, and then out of Liverpool, from Liverpool, it came uh, to Prince Edward Island. This was in 1847, May, I think. Um, to get this precise date in 1847, but it took 27 days to cross the Atlantic. Now, there were 444 passengers on that vessel. And as some of you know, Liverpool is sometimes referred to as the Irish capital of England because that's the population, the Irish population of Liverpool is, is very great. And uh, so that there's a mixture of people there uh, from various counties of Ireland. And, uh, and so when we refer to this ship bringing northerners, there were also people from other counties uh, aboard this vessel. On the way over, 25 people died of typhoid fever. And when the ship arrived in Charlottetown, uh, and uh, before the quarantine took effect, another eight died. Then the quarantine, the people here were very confused. Uh, the uh, system, the uh, health system at, at that time wasn't geared to take care of uh, an emergency like this, you know, a catastrophe. And so understandably they weren't prepared for it. But they did get a, a, a house in the east end of town and uh, set it up as a temporary hospital to take care of the, uh, the people who were sick aboard that vessel. And then uh, afterwards, uh, they, they took over what had been the insane asylum and used that as a hospital uh, for the victims of uh, typhus who had come on this fever ship out of uh, Liverpool. And uh, another, well, 11 people died in the first place in the, in the uh, little yellow 
house that they uh, uh, used, and 11 or 12, including one of the nurses, uh, died at the asylum. So it adds up to 55 victims out of a total of 444 starting out. Um, it was a great threat to the people here and, and great concern expressed by the residents of Charlottetown uh, because this was a, a very malignant uh, type of uh, typhus and there was a danger of it spreading all over. And indeed, a number of, of the citizens of the town that became ill as well as those who were aboard the ship. But this was the first, uh, this the first, the only uh, fever ship to come to Charlottetown, to come to the island. There was another vessel that, that had come in 47, uh, but uh, there was no indication of, of any illness or uh, fever or anything like that aboard. So we, we don't count that as a, as a fever ship. Well, the first people to come from Northern Ireland, uh, though, were brought here by the Lieutenant Governor, the first Lieutenant Governor of the island, Thomas Debrisay. And we can identify these, these people. They have been identified. Uh, by name. Thomas Debrisay was, uh, was born in, in Ireland. He was uh, uh, an army officer and uh, uh, a descendant of the family that had been granted land during the uh, Williamite uh, War near Durlas in, uh, in County Tipperary. And though his, his name would suggest that he was not Irish, the, not only he, but his descendants here on the island were indeed very insistent upon their Irishness and were among the founders of the Benevolent Irish Society and active members and presidents and secretaries and so on of the BIS. So the, the name is a French name and it would give you a, a clue to the origins of the family. These, uh, uh, this family were descendants of the, a Huguenot regiment that uh, had come in the occupation of Ireland and uh, as a reward for their service uh, to King William, they were given grants of land. So that's how the Debrisays uh, got to Ireland. And uh, Mr. Debrisay, even though he had been appointed Lieutenant Governor, you know, in, in those days, the early colonial period, there was a governor and a lieutenant governor, both, and uh, so he didn't come out to, uh, to do his work here until he had first recruited some uh, settlers for his lands that he had bought here on the island. He had not been awarded any lots in the, in the lottery of 1867, but he did purchase uh, lots 31 and 33, and uh, and then he wanted to uh, populate them. And Governor Patterson also uh, had uh, lot 19 up toward the summer side, there. and and uh, he wanted to uh, bring out settlers for it too. And so uh, Debrisay went about Ireland recruiting people. He, he first started in the south of Ireland, down in, in Wexford and Tipperary, and eventually worked his way up to the north. And it was in the north that he found some people who were interested. So uh, uh, as you can see from this uh, list, I don't know if you can make out the names, I don't know how, how clear it, it is, but that, that might be a little bit better. Uh, the names like Rogers, Thornton, McNeely, Bunting, Watson, Hyde, Walker, Morrow, McGuire, Belshaw, some of these names still exist on the island, but many of them do not. But of these 10 people who received grants <coughs> of land, uh, nine of the 10 were from the one county in Northern Ireland called Antrim, 
and one was from County Down. And all of them settled then in Lot 31. Uh, and each one had a hundred acres. Now besides those people uh, who came out here in uh, 1711, uh, 1811, 1811, besides, no, let's get it right, 1771, okay? <laughs> 77. Besides that, uh, th these 25 people obtained leases from uh, Lieutenant Governor Thomas Debersay and uh, you can see uh, the variety of names, Kennedy, Craig Thompson, Rogers, Patterson, Mickey McGuire, uh, another Patterson, McCracken, McDonnell, McDonald, uh, McConnell, McCown, Druitt, and Heinemann. All right, uh, so these are, these are people from several counties, from Antrim, and down and Tyrone and Armagh and Monaghan even and uh, does that cover all I think the, all the counties that are represented there and some of them had a hundred acres some had 200 some had only 50 or share, especially if they were not going to farm full-time if they were weavers or uh, uh, occupied in some other way Taylor, here's a Taylor, 50 acres, but most of them had 100 acres, and some of them grouped together and, and got a larger farm, like these people had 300 acres, but there are three families of Brown, uh, Carson, and Crosby, all right? And, and these names are still, some of those names are still in uh, the uh, in Prince Edward Island and, and in the areas of what, 31 and 33. Okay, so the, these name, this list in, incidentally appeared in uh, the Island Magazine last year, as I recall. So I don't know if there are any descendants of any of those people here, but that's the, the explanation of how they got here. What you may not know is that uh, uh, Mr. Debrisay almost got himself in trouble for recruiting in Ireland because that was uh, forbidden by the uh, government of the day and uh, the policy was uh, to recruit the Protestant people uh, from uh, the colonies uh, but not from Ireland itself and, uh, and so he was uh, going contrary uh, to the uh, explicit directions of the government of the day and uh, he was severely reprimanded. He didn't really apologize though but he, he did say that he didn't take any recruits uh, except those uh, who were permitted to go by the uh, owners of the estates in Ireland. So uh, anyhow he, he got away with and I would say about 25 families uh, could be counted among the Debrisay settlers of the island. And these 25 were all, as you can see, from the north. Well, that, uh, that didn't develop into, into very much, as a matter of fact. The, uh, the, there was no continuation of that immigration. It wasn't legal in the first place. And, uh, and so the supply was cut off there and it didn't, just didn't continue. It's some time before we find uh, another incident that uh, brings settlers uh, to us from the north. 1811-1812 is the period we move on to now. And uh, uh, a very strange thing happened that uh, brought to this island a number of people from the north of Ireland. A vessel sailing out of Belfast, which may have, may have called at Dublin on the way. We're going to follow, follow it here from Belfast. Let's say it stopped at Dublin briefly pick up some more passengers and continued toward America. It's called the Belisarius. The Belisarius 
all right? And uh, it, on its way toward America, it was intercepted at sea off the south coast of Newfoundland. It was intercepted uh, by a British naval vessel called the Atlanta, Atalanta, right? That was on June 24, 1811. And uh, we, we can pause here just for a moment to explain why this was done. The official reason given was that some of the people aboard that vessel had not received customs clearances and were not uh, therefore supposed to be uh, sailing uh, out of their home port for America. Uh, but another reason not stated was that it was the, a practice in, in that time for uh, the British Navy to uh, uh, impress, is the word that they use, uh, to, to take from the commercial vessels able-bodied seamen uh, and put them into service in the British Navy. And so uh, when this vessel was intercepted, these uh, Irish people were taken off uh, the, the ship, off the Belisarius, put aboard the Atalanta, and that vessel then sailed for Halifax. Now, as the, uh, the larger vessel approached Halifax, another vessel called the Aeolus went out to meet it and took the passengers, the Irish people, from that vessel, the civilians, left a number of the able-bodied men aboard the, the battleship. I think 17 of them were left aboard the ship and that ship went off, disappeared into history, right? And so these men were separated from their families. Their families went on in tears toward Halifax aboard the Aeolus. When the Aeolus reached Halifax, the uh, two of the passengers aboard were permitted to go ashore, two gentlemen, and they were the ones who then reported what had happened, and they evidently knew the names of many of the people, uh, including the, the gentlemen who were taken aboard the Atalanta, and uh, as I say, this disappeared. Um, but they, they knew uh, the other civilians who were now aboard the Aeolus. And uh, the Aeolus was, was under the command of uh, a gentle man from, uh, from England, Lord James Townsend. Now, Lord James's father had been a, an officer in the British forces uh, at the uh, Battle of Quebec and served under General Wolfe and uh, uh, Viscount, he was, Viscount Townshend, and he received a grant of land here in Prince Edward Island, Lot 56, uh, for his service in, in that uh, war. And his son, who was the captain of this uh, vessel, Aeolus, inherited that property. So when uh, when these Irish civilians were taken captive on the high seas in this manner and they came toward Halifax and were then transferred to the smaller vessel, uh, Lord Townsend asked permission of uh, his superior uh, to take these people to his inherited lands, Lot 56, in Prince Edward Island, and that permission was granted, and so he brought these families through the Strait of Canso over to uh, Kings County and, uh, and landed them there with provisions, uh, some provisions, and uh, helped them uh, get established and put up temporary housing and so on. Um, 
it so happened that aboard his vessel uh, was a young uh, sailor, midshipman, who later became a captain himself, uh, Captain Marriott. And Captain Marriott went on to become a very distinguished writer, famous popular writer. I don't think you'd call him a great writer, but popular anyhow, very popular writer. And uh, in one of his books, he tells this story and tells it uh, very graphically uh, as though he were right on the scene and observed uh, all of this action. And uh, so we do have a fictional account, a fictional account, not a fictitious account, uh, but it is fictionalized. It's uh, what happened, but, the, uh, but uh, put in the form of a story, of a novel. And so uh, we have another uh, group of uh, Irish people from the north of Ireland landed in PEI. And again, just not very long ago, within the past 10 years, uh, a source indicated to the Heritage Foundation uh, the discovery of a number of names of, of these people. And uh, uh, whether, whether that's entirely accurate or not, I, I have no way of knowing. Uh, but uh, most of those families did not stay here. Uh, they, they came, uh, moved on as soon as they could. Uh, their intent in coming to uh, this continent was to go to the United States, not to come to Prince Edward Island. Uh, they were uh, uh, victims of uh, fate, you might say, or or victims of this uh, uh, unjust uh, action on the high seas. It wasn't their intent to be here. Some of them evidently stayed, and it was in that community that one of the uh, most famous events and notorious events of Ireland history occurred when uh, Patrick Pierce uh, killed the land agent, uh, Mr. Abel. And, uh, Pierce, it is believed, was among the people who came to that community in, in this fashion. Anyhow, uh, very few of the names that have turned up uh, are still related to that area. And, uh, and so, as a colony, it did not really take. But still, it was, uh, uh, it is best explained as as one of the Ulster uh, contributions uh, to the island. Now, we go from, from there to the next. The next group of Northern Irish people come by a strange route as well. Now, uh, I, I think what you're, you're going, some people at least, are going to be uh, amazed. Uh, so am I. I was going to say amazed when my book comes out. <laughs> so am I going to be amazed when, if, if they read how in the world these 10,000 Irishmen got here. There is no pattern. There is so much accident, happenstance. It, it was pure luck, it was fate, it was accident. And, uh, and uh, so to explain what happens next, we have to go to Scotland to explain how the Irish uh, from Northern Ireland, how the next group of Irish uh, came to be here. Well, I don't have an ideal map for this purpose, but I, it, it will serve, I, I think. I hope you can see it from back there. This is Ireland over here, Belfast. I don't, uh, Dublin. It's not necessary to put a lot of names in that. Ireland is here and Scotland is here. So Scotland is on the north and east of Ireland. 
not directly across, but northeasterly direction. And the distance between uh, this corner of Antrim and the Mull of Kintyre over here is about the same as from uh, Wood Islands to Nova Scotia. You know, it's, it's that in, in that vicinity, something like 18 miles across this channel. So from here, you can see Scotland in the back and forth. And if you know your, your history, the early the Celtic history, you understand that at one time, these Celtic nations were, were all one people. And uh, that it is quite correct to think of the Irish and the Scots as being Celtic cousins. So that's what the, what they were historically, um, and they have they still have a great deal in common. But in in ages past, they had a common language, and uh, they even called this area of Scotland Scotia, because the Scotty were the Irish, and so. Uh, and the other uh, uh, Scotia Minor then becomes Scotland and Era becomes Ireland, Ireland, and so they start to drift apart to develop independently of one another. But without going way back into history at all, let's come up to the 18th century. And this is what we find because of the proximity of these two land masses, the commerce that went on between them continued and was extremely active. Perhaps I should have said earlier that just up here uh, west of Glasgow is a place called Dumbarton, where St. Patrick was born and uh, where he was taken prisoner and then brought over uh, to the Slemish Mountains in Antrim uh, as a slave, as a, a shepherd. Um, at least that's one version. Uh, there are several nations that claim uh, St. Patrick as having been born in their country, but this is one of the claims of, of the, uh, the people of Scotland and uh, it seems to have some validity uh, to it. So uh, from ancient times, there, the, the, there was commerce, traffic back and forth. So it won't surprise you to know that in the 18th century there were massive movements of people from Ireland over to the west, particularly the west coast of Scotland and the Highlands, particularly during the harvest season. They, they went there to help with the harvest, so they would go over, work the harvest, and then return uh, to Ireland. And they would have, as a result of that, enough money for them to get by, just squeak by for another year. And so this was an annual thing. And several writers have, have written about this phenomenon of the, the hiring fairs, so that uh, uh, they explain that uh, the the foremen and the leaders of the of the uh, Scottish agriculture would come to Ireland, and fairs were conducted in various uh, towns in Northern Ireland. And the young men would uh, line up if they were looking for work, and the foreman would look them over and and uh, feel their muscles and uh, take a glance at them, and, uh, you know, have them stick out their tongue, make sure they weren't sick, you know. And some, the ones who looked like likely prosper, stand over there, you know, and then, then he'd get separate them that way and then uh, uh, speak to them and say he was, you know, go with me and uh, uh, we'll give you a pound six or something uh, for uh, so many weeks and months of work. And uh, they had to accept it. You know, they, they didn't bargain. They, if, if they argued, He'd say, okay, go back to the others. And he always got enough, the, the, the foreman always got enough, the boss, as he was called. 
and he would then take these young men, some women uh, too, uh, over to, uh, uh, to Glasgow uh, from Derry, from the port of Derry or from the port of Belfast, uh, right up uh, here to the, the Firth of Clyde, right to, to Glasgow. Very easy journey from Ireland and uh, from there they would be assigned, they would be put to work in the fields. But then as the 19th century approached, uh, the, and this was a regular custom of Irishmen going over to work in Scotland. Um, some of them stayed, of course. Some stayed on and then they married over there. And uh, that's how you got the so-called Glasgow Irish. But besides the working in the fields, they worked in the shipyards. They worked in mines. They, they worked on the railroads when they were building them. They worked on the roads when they were preparing the roads, not paving them yet, but uh, making roads. So they did manual labor, work that evidently uh, they couldn't get enough people in Scotland to do it, so uh, the, the Irish were unemployed and uh, looking for uh, some money, so they, they went to work. Uh, and th they lived in the, the worst of conditions. Uh, th there's a very fine book by a man named Handley, H-A-N-D-L-E-Y, on this subject in which he describes uh, the subhuman conditions under which uh, these people labored and worked and labored long, long hours and then uh, slept on the ground or straw or uh, some makeshift arrangement and uh, uh, barely had enough to eat and so on. But they, uh, they behaved themselves and didn't uh, go out drinking too often or gambling too often. They would have money to take home and keep the family together in Ireland. So uh, Glasgow then developed into uh, a city that had a, a quite a heavy Irish population. At one time, the, uh, in the early 1800s, the 40% uh, of the people of Glasgow were of Irish origin. And so, uh, and of course, they, they became assimilated and they, they, didn't, they married there and they uh, lived there and they brought up their families and so on. And as time passed, though they retained their Irish names uh, for all other purposes, they, they were Scots, you know, they became absorbed into the population of, of Scotland along with their, their ancient cousins. Now, it so happened about 1826 that uh, a young man from Prince Edward Island whose father uh, was a, a land owner and uh, big estates here on the island. The, his name, father's name was John MacDonald, Captain John MacDonald, uh, who uh, established one of the really large, successful colonies uh, in Prince Edward Island. Uh, his, uh, his son, his fourth son, I believe he was, uh, determined to uh, study for the Catholic priesthood. And uh, in order to, uh, to realize his, uh, his desire, he went to uh, Europe to study. Now, uh, young John MacDonald was uh, a very intelligent and capable scholar, linguist, and uh, uh, was a devout person who, who really was earnest about becoming a priest. And while he was uh, in France studying, uh, as you know, the McDonald's fortunes ran out here on the island. And, uh, and so he applied uh, to the Bishop of Scotland uh, and agreed to, uh, to serve for five years in Scotland uh, after his ordination if he would be financed uh, in his studies on the continent. And, uh, and this was agreed to 
and he returned, uh, according to the bargain, to Glasgow. Uh, the, the great church, and Catholic church in Glasgow, was St. Andrews, and it had uh, just been built, completed, I, I guess, or nearly complete, when Father John MacDonald arrived there as a curate and served his time in the Glasgow church. You can visit that church today and still the, the same original building. Anyhow, uh, the, uh, Fa Father John, when his time had been served, determined then to come home to Prince Edward Island. And he invited his parishioners uh, those who were interested, who might become interested, to come with him to the island and take up farms on his property. Uh, he had been uh, uh, willed uh, something like 17,000 acres uh, in the Fort Augustus area of Prince Edward Island. And so uh, he uh, invited the people to come. He told them about his land. He made them uh, some good offers, promises of uh, aid in getting started, and what seemed to be reasonable rents, and so on. And so a group of, of those people uh, agreed to come with him. He hired a vessel called the Corsair and sailed out of Greenock in Scotland, in Glasgow, just down the shore here at Greenock, uh, sailed. Uh, from there uh, out to his estate in Fort Augustus. Now, the people, remember what I said about these Irish people being in Scotland and, uh, and particularly in Glasgow, the people who came with him were natives of Northern Ireland. They were from various counties, and we, we have a number of names, I, I think I list 16 or so of the 30 families who came out with Father uh, John MacDonald. Uh, they uh, came out to, to Fort Augustus, and among, among those people uh, were uh, some people from County Monaghan. So this is all by way of leading up to and explaining how more people from Northern Ireland came to PEI. Between, well, let's, let's go on to our, our next uh, map. This In County Monaghan itself, uh, between 1835 and 1848, in that, in that period, 1834 to 48, um, at least 3,200 people left the northern parishes of County Monaghan to come to Prince Edward Island. And the way it happened was, uh, was this, that those who came with Father John, among those who came, uh, one of them suggested that Father John write to his parish priest in Dona, uh, County Monaghan, to uh, inform him of the settlement in PEI and to see if other people would be interested in coming. And uh, so Father John did write to Father Patrick Mina, M-O-Y-N-A-G-H, Miney, some people pronounce it, Mina, Moina, the various pronunciations, the families of that name in, in PEI. Um, anyhow, he wrote to Father Patrick, and uh, Father Patrick Moyna uh, encouraged his parishioners to take an interest in this opportunity. At the same time that Father Moyna was encouraging his people to leave, to better themselves in the world, because the prospects were not particularly bright in County Monaghan at that time, um, his uh, assistant priest was speaking against him, uh, presenting the other point of view, and arguing that uh, 
uh, the, the place would be uh, depopulated if this were encouraged. And uh, then what would happen to the parishes in Ireland and who would support them and so on. So uh, th there was a difference of, of opinion on that. But evidently, Father Moyna's uh, view prevailed, at least among some of them. And, uh, and so they came out uh, to Prince Edward Island. Now, once they came, they told the story, and more relatives and friends came, and it went on and on and on. A chain reaction set in, you see? And, uh, you, you see this and you hear about it all the time here in Prince Edward Island. So for us, it, it is not new. We can understand this immediately. Oh, yeah, somebody went down to Texas and got a job in a hospital there. And now there are 60 girls from PEI nurses in the hospitals down there. You know, it just, one tells another and the word spreads and then all of a sudden people are, are, are going you know, in droves, or they went out to Calgary at one time, and they went to Toronto, and of course, before that, they went to Boston, hundreds and hundreds of them from Prince Edward Island. Well, this is exactly what their ancestors did, too, in these five or six parishes of the northern part of County Monaghan. Very, very few from the southern part of County Monaghan. Now, Monaghan is just a small place. <laughs> when you put it on a map or you put it up here, it looks like it might be a big... It's about half the size of Kings County, something like that, yeah. in size. So it's, it's not a very large area. And if you can imagine, uh, just taking the, the eastern end of Kings County, and, and clearing out 3,200 people from there. Even Paul Martin didn't do that. But ima imagine doing something like that. Then you have some idea of the impact this must have had back in County Monaghan. So they, uh, they came here during that 14-year period or so uh, by the hundreds and, as it turns out, thousands. Now, immigrants to Prince Edward Island. If you start way back there in 1771, and we'll come forward very rapidly, the ones I have underlined, those three ships brought the Debrisay families here, all right? The John and James and the Yalward. Right? So those are the people can. And then the next ship from the north of Ireland to come here is 1830, the Corsair. But it didn't come from Ireland, it came from Scotland, as I have explained. John, Reverend John MacDonald and 206 settlers to Fort Augustus. So <coughs> most of those people who came with Father John, the vast number of them were Irish, and of those Irish people, the predominant uh, group came from Northern Ireland. So then we look down the list of the ships that are recorded. Now, uh, the historian for the Heritage Foundation uh, thinks that this is, uh, maybe only half the ships are accounted for. They didn't have to report, and records were not kept very well in those days. And uh, we, we have very few passenger lists, very, very few. But uh, uh, there are reports of the numbers of people aboard many of these vessels and where they came from. So it isn't until 1835 uh, that the grace of Newcastle uh, sailed from Belfast with 196 uh, passengers, all right? And uh, then in the same year, the Margot from Belfast with 80 more. And so we have this great movement starting, and at last, the impact of the Northern Irish is beginning to be felt. 
1837, the Lady Anne from County Monaghan, by way of Wallace, Nova Scotia. So it stopped. The, the people were uh, deposited, disembarked there, and then came over to the island on smaller vessels, 35 of them. 1839, the Kongsbrook, 308 people now, we're getting into numbers, chiefly from County Monaghan, and they all came to Fort Augustus. The agitator from Belfast with 314, that's in one year, so you have 622 people in one year, Irish people. In 1840, the Rosebank from Belfast with 208, chiefly from County Monaghan, but not exclusively. And uh, then in 1841, uh, the uh, Margaret Pollock and the Thomas Jelston. Six hundred and eighty-five, twenty-eight of them died of measles, uh, but uh, 139 came on the Thomas Jelson then, and the Thomas Jelson comes again the following year with 280, and uh, Morgiana with 145, and another time it came with 66 the same year, and so it goes. The chieftain with 208 people out of Belfast, chieftain, the Rosebank with 150, the Independence headed for Quebec but disembarked 156 people here and then continued on to Quebec, and the Margareta, an unknown number, Fanny, an unknown number, and then the Lady Constable with 444 I told you about already. So you, you can imagine some of the uh, logistical problems here in Charlottetown when 650 people, 650 Irishmen, <laughs> I should say, <laughs> landed here in one day. You know, they, they think they have problems downtown now. <laughs> uh, but anyhow, uh, this, this happened and, uh, and so, and so, uh, many of these people stayed here in Charlottetown. And no doubt some of you here are descendants of these people who uh, arrived in the 1840s in Charlottetown, and, uh, and your history goes back uh, for 150 years uh, here in, in Charlottetown. Many of you uh, are descendants of country people, though, who have moved into the city since then. All right, I have a, a few other pages here that I didn't refer to when I, when I printed them. I want to see. How do we know? Where do we get the information? See, I, when I first looked into these things, one of the things I did, and it was the most enjoyable, I went around to every graveyard on the island and I wrote down <laughs> the names and the information. Uh, this was before the, all these things were recorded by the Heritage Foundation. Now you just go down to the archives and, and in the comfort there uh, you, you can look up the information or, or, or use the, uh, uh, the files and, and you don't have to go outdoors. It's too bad because uh, it's good <laughs> to be outdoors and it's good to travel around the island and to see for yourself and to read these things. But the lazy man's way is to go to the archives. In those days, there was no lazy man's way. If you wanted to do it, do it, you went out and did it. And I didn't compile this list. This comes uh, from the Heritage Foundation. But what they found is essentially what I found with some differences. You know, I, I think I have more names than, than they do, but that doesn't, that doesn't matter. Uh, some things they, they have done much better uh, than I could ever hope to do. But if you go and look at the tombstones around the island, and uh, you, you'll see from County Antrim, it may, these are some of the names of the people from County Antrim 
as recorded on their tombstones. Now, this, this is just the beginning of the search. A lot of detective work in this. And, and one way you, you find out about the people, you check the tombstones. I would say that fewer than 10% of the people put on their tombstones where they were born. So it'll give you some good information, all right, but very incomplete, you know. So these are the, the counties of Ulster, just this small handful, handful of people from Antrim, uh, Clo, uh, McKeenan, Pemphill, Mooney, uh, Frizzle. Th these names from County Antrim, Armagh, a little longer list, but far, far from complete. County Cavan, just three names, Father Brady and, and two others. There are Elizabeth Wood and Patrick McGurk. Um, County Donegal, only one person from County Donegal uh, chose to have his name on, on a tombstone, John Crawford Sr. Um, County Down, uh, again, just four, five or six. And you might get the impression that there weren't very many people from these places. The truth of the matter is that not many people put their, their information on their tombstones. They didn't dictate it before they died, and their descendants were lucky enough to have enough money to put up a stone at all, let alone have someone carve all this kind of information on them. So. It is one source of information, but not uh, an exhaustive source at all. What this does reveal to you, though, is when you look at the list from County Monaghan, it's as long as all the other eight counties put together for tombstone information. And this is a clue which it begins to tell you, as it began to tell me, 15 years ago, the Monaghan component seems to be the dominant one. There are more people from, judging by the tombstone, more from Monaghan than any of the other counties in the north. Well, when you do this for all 32 counties, well, this is what you find, not just by the tombstones, so though, you have to use many other sources. But every single county of Ireland is represented in Prince Edward Island, all 32 counties. This is a very Irish place, all 32 counties. No place else in eastern Canada is that true. And so much of it just happened by accident. Okay? You might want to look at these <coughs> lists later on and free to come up and put these on the screen again if, if you wish. I, I think what I would like to do now is to sum up and bring this matter to a close for tonight. Ulster Emigration and Settlement. What's it all about? I've tried to indicate to you how these people got here various ways. The diversity of them is one of the most remarkable things about them. And this does not parallel what you find in New Brunswick or Nova Scotia or Newfoundland. This is a very distinctive place. Uh, the, uh, all nine counties of the north sent out settlers here, and they did so over a period of 75 years. That is, going back to uh, Debrisay and Patterson and coming up uh, to uh, the Lady Constable, 75 years elapsed. They were motivated in various ways to come. Why did they come? Well, some of them were persuaded by uh, recruiters like Deborah Say himself, but this also applied to southern counties. They had their recruiters, and so did uh, uh, the Monaghan people. It was Mr. Trainer, who was a recruiter for Father John MacDonald and went back to Monaghan and rounded up people and uh, made the arrangements for them and so on. So 
that was the system of the day. You would use a recruiter. Um, some of them assumed that there were opportunities here and, uh, and decided to, uh, to come out because uh, things were not going so well in Ireland and they thought they might do better here. Some of them, as we have seen with respect to the Eolus, uh, for example, uh, got here by happenstance. It, it was not by planning at all. It was by accident, by fate. In this instance, they were the wards of, uh, of war. And uh, this, you know, that was the cause of the uh, War of 1812, at least from the American point of view. The impressment of seamen uh, was one of the reasons the United States went to war with Britain in 1812. And so we benefited by some of those victims coming here. Others came to escape the poverty that was rampant all over Ireland under the uh, system of occupation of the time. Uh, some of them were pulled here uh, by the chain migration. This is one of the influences. Once their cousins and their relatives come out and start sending letters home or occasionally sending them a few dollars, they think of this as a land of great wealth and they're drawn uh, by that. Uh, pulled by the chain migration uh, psychology to come, and then some, but not 10% even, of the Irish people who came here came because of the famine. The only ship that we are certain about is the Lady Constable. There were minor famines, not the Great Famine, but there, there were periodic and local um, uh, crop failures that led people to leave Ireland. But when you're talking about the famine, the famine, you mean the great famine uh, of the 1845-48 era. Uh, the people who came here were a mixed social and cultural background too not only from all nine counties, but they came from various uh, strata of society. Some were rather well-to-do. Some of them were very competent tradesmen and craftsmen. Many of them were, actually. Uh, some of them were extremely competent uh, farmers, agriculturalists. So they weren't all poor people or incapable people by any means. Uh, the mixture that you get in this way is dominated. The great element, the, the first thing that would be listed uh, for the recipe uh, would be County Monaghan, because this is where the dominant group came from. And when you talk about these people, you're talking about the chauvinistic people. They stick together. They like one another. They're proud of being from County Monaghan. I, I can say all of these things. I, I don't have the uh, Monaghan uh, connections, you know, in a family way, but I do have uh, uh, fairly intimate contact with uh, County Monaghan and with the people there and I have a great respect, a great love for them so that when I say something about them it's not because I'm being critical or negative and uh, when I say that they uh, tend to be aggressive I'm talking about compared to their countrymen. You look at the history of Prince Edward Island as I've been doing for 17 years now and you'll see who the, the aggressive ones are, who the fighters are, who the ones are who are the, the pushers. They're a volatile people. They can be angered pretty easily. They're willing to fight. Uh, they seem to have inherited this, if it's possible to inherit uh, qualities like that. Uh, at least historically, they are aware that you, you have to be prepared. Uh, 
you don't let people push you around. Well, they differ. They differ from the people who had come, these gentle, kind souls from my father's county in Tipperary. <laughs> who, in, they, these are tough people. They, they were brought up differently. They had to face uh, conflicts more frequently and on a daily basis up in County Monaghan, whereas uh, the people in the southeast could live a, a, a much more a serene kind of existence. Sectarianism is one of the factors we have to consider when we talk about what happened after these people came out. Ulster has been called the, the crucible of sectarian strife, the cauldron, you know, the, 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 the melting pot of, of sectarianism, of conflict between Roman Catholic and Protestant people. Monaghan itself is right on the border of what is now known as Northern Ireland. And the reason Monaghan and Cavan and Donegal were not included in the separate state of Ulster uh, under British rule was that these were predominantly Catholic uh, counties. And uh, to include them in Ulster would have meant uh, a balance numerically in favor of the Catholic people instead of retaining uh, the majority for the Protestant people. So historically we, we understand, and we're, this is not a criticism, just a, making a factual observation, that these counties bordering on the hotbed of uh, sectarianism were also part influence they were, uh, within the orbit of uh, this kind of, of uh, uh, religious bitterness. The uh, people then who came from the north of Ireland uh, came from uh, mixed religions. There were Protestants of various stripes. There were Roman Catholics who went to church and Roman Catholics who didn't <laughs> and, uh, and so on. So you have all this mixture and they come from different cultural backgrounds because you do have the poor, the well-to-do, the uh, landowners, and so on. 10% of the pop uh, Irish population of Prince Edward Island were Protestants. Contrast that now with Ontario when the opposite was true. The 90% was the other way around and the 10% of the Roman Catholics. Uh, contrasted even with New Brunswick, over half of the Irish people of New Brunswick were Protestant. Over half the people, Irish people of Nova Scotia uh, at that time were uh, of Protestant origin, so that the Londonderry settlement, the McNutt settlement of the Nova Scotia, for example, uh, would, uh, would indicate that. So, Prince Edward Island is really distinctive here in the Maritimes in having this kind of a distribution of a 90 to 10 percent uh, of the population from Ireland being of Roman Catholic persuasion. Um, just on the border, just beyond the border of, of County Monaghan in County Armagh, uh, Orangism was founded and uh, this uh, organization uh, came to America. It went wherever uh, the, the people of that persuasion went around the world and uh, so it came to Prince Edward Island and, and in the 1850s, 60s mainly, uh, many Orange Lodges were founded here. But think about the situation that this was supposed to have been uh, a Protestant colony. And now you find 47% of the people being Roman Catholic. That's uh, 
it, it, Protestant people living here, uh, that must have been uh, uh, a danger sign that uh, that their uh, their position was in danger, their privilege was in danger, and so they saw in this massive movement from County Monaghan Catholic power, and uh, it's not surprising to me, uh, and it shouldn't be to you, uh, that the conflicts of the old country continue in the 19th century and indeed in the 20th century in part uh, here in, uh, in Prince Edward Island. And so there were these orange and green fights and riots and so on that took place here, including uh, the one in 1877 in Charlottetown. So uh, this is a, a heritage of the old country brought over here. The remarkable thing, and it has to be said, there's a very fine book on this uh, subject called The Sash Canada War, uh, written by professors Houston and Smith um, from Toronto. And they, their book is about the orange movement in Canada. And they are aware, though they spent very little time in Prince Edward Island, that there was not an Irish population uh, to uh, provide the membership for the Orange Lodge so that these are not Irish institutions, though there are some Irish members now. Uh, they, they were mainly made up of uh, Protestant people of other national origins, Scottish and English and perhaps Welsh, I don't know. Um, so we have the lodges, all right, and we have the Catholic power, all right, and so we have the conflicts, too. So when we talk about this immigration from Northern Ireland, uh, in some respects, a lot of good came of it, and in some respects, some uh, bad things happened and some uh, violent happenings, all right? The government itself, uh, now, these people from the north of Ireland settled mainly in rural areas. And this is very important when you're talking about immigration and family history and genealogy and all these things, social history, because settling in rural areas gives an assurance of stability of family, culture, and a continuity of names. If you want to get rid of all this, send your kids to the city. They lose their culture, they lose their names, they lose their interests, they lose their identity very rapidly. The cities destroy culture. But the people who came here went mainly to the country, and that is why we have the BIS to this day, because these virtues and these values are are perpetuated by rural people, retained and perpetuated. Charlottetown itself became a special haven for the Monaghan people. It was called an Irish town. 40% of the people of Charlottetown were, in the 19th century, of Irish origin. These Monaghans and uh, the Northerners generally were more concentrated than the earlier settlers from Tipperary and uh, Wexford and Waterford and uh, Cork and so on. Those people, when they came out, they scattered all over the island. The chauvinistic Monaghan people congregated together. They stayed together and they formed communities of their own. And so you could go not so much today, but at one time, you could go through King Cora and you would see, or through Kelly's Cross or Fort Augustus, and you would see the same names, you would see the same faces, you would see the same mannerisms as you would walking through the parishes of Northern Monaghan. This was just a replication of what was over in the old country. In the communities that they founded here, and they continued to to live together. So these people had a greater impact 
than if they had scattered, as the people from the south and the west of Ireland did. They scattered all over the island, but not the Monaghans. They are between the, the two borders of the counties, along the county lines, mainly in Queens County and along the county line, and they didn't go too far beyond that when they settled in originally. So here you have this huge concentration, and that means they had a greater impact socially, politically, religiously. They had a greater impact than the other 6,000 Irish people who came here. So they're, they're, they are a minority in relation to the total number who came, but they have so much more power because of the way they came and the way they settled. Normally, they marry their own. This is their expression. They used to urge their, their children, marry your own now, marry your own. So that you, you married somebody who was known to you, known to your family, somebody from a, another good Monahan family, you see. And uh, this way you perpetuate the system of family ties and family values from generation to generation. And that went on all through the 19th and indeed well into the 20th century. I wouldn't want to say that it is still a common thing, but it was. Um, they mixed with the earlier Irish, too. At first, not so well. They tended to fight with them because they, they uh, had a disregard for the, for the Southies, as they called them, the yellow bellies. And they would taunt them and get into fights. And, of course, the people from Wexford and Waterford <laughs> had the, their names for the, the Monaghan bastards, as they called them. <laughs> and, uh, and so they, they had frequent faction fights. None, none that really got so out of hand that there were deaths, but uh, a lot of broken bones and that kind of thing. Um, they got along pretty well with their other neighbors, and in due time uh, they mixed with them and intermarried, particularly with uh, uh, Scottish people of uh, Roman Catholic uh, faith. So they were politicized. When they came and before they came here, Daniel O'Connell started his great campaign and won the first election in County Monaghan. The, the land movement in County Monaghan set the tone for much of the uh, activity in the north. These people went, went out and struggled for what they got. They were used to it. This was part of their history. And I devote a whole chapter to the pre-immigration County Monaghan so people will understand where they came from, how they got to be the way they are. Right? And it's all explainable in, in, uh, in the history of, of that county. They were activists over there. They were activists here. And their descendants still have a bit of fight left in them, too. So, to sum it up, the numerical force of these people now, they're in, uh, led to their influence, their influence in the social life of Prince Edward Island, in the political life of the country, in the religious life, which is another chapter, Prince Edward Island, and the, uh, while all of this was going on, uh, an even more important thing was happening. They were becoming assimilated into their new land. They didn't lose any of the distinctive marks of their old country. They retained a great deal from old Ireland and uh, at the same time, they very warmly and very strongly embraced the ideals, the aims of their adopted country and of the province that they made their home. And they became outstanding Canadians and outstanding Islanders. That's the story of the immigrants from the north of Ireland.
they want to, but I, you know, I think it's late enough. But, you know, it's pretty good. Um, time is moving on, but if there's anyone who has a, a, a few questions, uh, doctors consented to uh, try and answer them. Are there any questions? One hand there. Billy. Yes. Yes, I could provide you with the list. Not um, not the full list of 400 or so. No, but I can. And what are the shifts in 1847? Um, it's on. It, I'll show it to you afterwards. I forget the name, but. Uh, Temporary, where the black zombies come from? Yes, yes, that's right. <laughs> Related, Jim? <laughs> <laughs> any, any other questions? Okay, if you have, uh, you can come up and put them to uh, Dr. O'Grady directly. I think now we we will take a break. And uh, I'll remind you, please sign your name on the list at the back of the hall so that we can put you on the mailing list. We like to have a record of, of people who are attending so that we can advise you of future events. And if you're interested in any of the tickets that I mentioned earlier, we can provide them as well. So let's break now and have a bite to eat and some coffee and tea and some more conversation.